remind you that food and drink are not permitted in the theater. Also, please note that photography and audio and video recording is prohibited. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Michelle Gray, the Director of Programming for the New York Times live conversation series, Times Talks, which pairs New York Times journalists with the brightest and boldest creative minds from the fields of film, theater, music, science, art, literature, and politics. To find out who's coming next, go to timestalks.com and subscribe to our newsletter. Also, make sure to share your thoughts on social. Our handle is at Timestalks across all platforms. The year 1967 saw the Vietnam War move into the most brutal, highest gear. 50 years later, America is still fighting over the war and its legacy. For a wide-ranging discussion on the country's most divisive conflict, we're thrilled to be welcoming documentary filmmakers Ken Burns and Lynn Novick, Vietnam veteran and best-selling novelist Carl Melantes, and memoirist Maya Elliott. You will hear much more about our esteemed guests and their upcoming PBS special, The Vietnam War, from our moderator, James Bennett, the editorial page director of The New York Times. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Lynn Novick, Carl Melantes, Maya Elliott, James Bennett, and Ken Burns. Hi, I'm James Bennett from the New York Times. It's a great honor to be here with this group to talk about this amazing film. I'd also like to welcome all of you here and also welcome the audience that's watching on uh, Facebook Live. Um, just to roadmap the conversation a little bit, we'll be going to questions from the audience later, and we'll be circulating microphones for that purpose. If you're watching on Facebook Live, we'll also take a couple of questions from you guys, and you can begin submitting those now. We're gonna, we're gonna get to watch four clips over the course of this conversation that'll help frame what we're discussing. But before we watch the first one, I thought it'd be helpful to hear from Ken or Lind a, a, a brief introduction to the scope of this project. A, a central argument of the film is that the Vietnam War is a hinge of American history. There was America before, and America, the one we live in now, after. And the scope of this project is, is just astounding. Well, first of all, thank you, James, for inviting us uh, this evening. Uh, you had an article in your paper today talking about the divisions that have, were planted 50 years ago, and that would put us in 1967, right as the war was really beginning to unravel. Uh, in 2006, Lynn and I were finishing a film on the Second World War called The War, and we realized, as you do, as you can see the light at the end of the tunnel, uh, that we, there was another war in us that we had to do, and we chose Vietnam. And so on Sunday, September 17th, PBS, by the way, the only network on Earth that would have devoted the resources and the time, the decade to do this, will begin broadcasting our 10-part, 18-hour series on the history of the Vietnam War. We have done more than 100 interviews, including many with North Vietnamese civilians and uh, North Vietnamese soldiers, with uh, Viet Cong guerrillas and South Vietnamese civilians and diplomats and protesters, as well as South Vietnamese soldiers, and then an entire range of Americans, uh, from helicopter pilots and uh, bombing pilots to Marines and Army men and uh, draft dodgers and sisters and Gold Star families and journalists and to give a range of it and we allowed that bottom-up story to sort of meet the top-down policy uh, decisions and mistakes from the Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson and Nixon administrations uh, and, and, and really we bring the film right up to the present. All right with that introduction why don't we watch the, why don't we watch the first clip please. One of the things that I learned in the war is that we're not the top species on the planet because we're nice. We are a very aggressive species. 
it is in us. And people talk a lot about how well the military turns, you know, kids into, you know, killing machines and stuff. And I'll always argue that it's just finishing school. What we do with civilization is that we learn to inhibit and rope in these aggressive tendencies. And we have to recognize them. I worry about a whole country that doesn't recognize it. Because you think of how many times we get ourselves in scrapes as a nation because we're always the good guys. Sometimes I think if we thought that we weren't always the good guys, we might actually get in less wars. Well, Carl. <laughs> We're done. Uh, I guess, yeah, everybody done. ready for a drink yeah. now? Um, I mean, it's a, it's a fairly devastating um, appraisal of human nature and, um, and then also of the uh, American national image of itself. And I wonder, in, your, in the course of your own service in Vietnam, how was it that you came to recognize that maybe we weren't the good guys? Mm. Well, it's, it's a long journey, but um, first of all, it started probably in college, uh, the arguments in the hall. And I mean, I joined the Marines when I was 18, and uh, I was in the reserves when I was at Yale. And I can remember one night arguing fiercely about the Vietnam War, probably it was like 1966 and uh, sputtering at these friends of mine saying, but, but an American president wouldn't lie to Americans. <laughs> and they laughed. And I, was, and I was like, I'm from this little logging town in Oregon, and it was like, they're laughing about this. I mean, so that was the beginning of, huh, mm, maybe I don't have it all right. And then when I got over there, um, I did horrible things. And the enemy did horrible things. I mean, I, I saw things that were just quite frankly pretty horrible. And, and I started to realize, well, I'm a good guy, but look what came out, uh, came out of me. And uh, you start to do things like, well, we take a hill and then we'd leave it. And then, so then you start wondering, well, why are, why are my friends dying here? So the, the whole thing starts to crumble when you see the actual reality of, of what humans do to each other. And then you start to see that, that there doesn't seem to be any meaning in what we're doing. I mean, we're taking hills and we're leaving them. I mean, my dad was in World War II and you know, they, they landed on the beach in, in France and then they went to Paris and then they went to the Rhine. They, they, they didn't have this sense of, what are we doing here? And so that begins to cause you to question. So it's the whole, the whole thing. Uh, and then, I, quite frankly, I got deeply interested in, in the work of Carl Jung and uh, mm. talking about shadow. And I began to go, uh-huh, this is, this is part of who we are. This is, we are very complex people. And if we don't admit that we encompass all of it, then we deny uh, our real humanity. And uh, it's, it's up to civilization to rein it in. Lynn, there are several um, veterans who are kind of threaded through the whole documentary. And um, they talk about their experiences. And you, know, and you get a sense of just tremendous agony, really, um, often from as they think back on the war. There's this one moment, one of them, I remember, paused and he said, I just don't know how to explain it today in a way that makes sense when he's trying to talk about the way they treated prisoners of war, I think, was actually what he was speaking about. Was it hard to get people to open up about it, or were they eager to talk about their experiences? The answer is a little bit of both. Yeah. I think something happened to my, I forget. That's okay. better. I think the answer is a little bit of both. We lost you again, I'm afraid. Maybe. Can I borrow? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Best laid plans. Okay. I, I'll try one more time. The honest answer is a little bit of both in that, you know, um, we tended to talk to people ahead of time and explain what we wanted to do and that we wanted to hear what it was really like and to find people who would be as honest and um, open as Carl and John Musgrave, the man that you're talking about. Uh, we talked to hundreds, if not thousands of people to find the ones that we thought people would be the most um, in touch with themselves actually, and be able to understand their feelings and their experiences and relate them to us. And so 
It's not that people were reluctant to talk for some sort of philosophical reason. It's just it's hard to do, I think. It's just difficult. And I don't know. I, I can't even speak to what it was like for, for Carl or for John Musk or many of the other people who shared their stories with us to really let us in on some pretty deep human experiences. And um, the one thing I think we take away from it, first of all, gratitude, incredible gratitude for the courage and the generosity of the 80 people you see in the film who shared their stories with us, but also appreciation that I think they found it helpful and, and sort of um, meaningful to put words around these rather inexpressible experiences. And we are, you know, we don't have words actually to describe how grateful we are for that. There's a, there's a kind of synthesis of what Carl and Lynn have said that I think is interesting. We always, as human beings, part of this human nature that Carl described so, I think, accurately, um, the other side of it is that we tend to abstract war after we've participated in it. And then that way we can sentimentalize it, that way we can turn it into something that is, is comfortable for us. We can call it the Second World War the good war, when in fact it's the worst war ever. And I think what happens is that we then begin to talk about Vietnam uh, from a dialectic in which it's us against them or different ideologies or whatever it is. But what Carl is bringing up and what Lynn is talking about is that these divisions are often within us and that we manifest many different aspects of it. So it can't just be a conversation of, well, he's for the war, or he's against the war, or she's somewhere here. But in fact, we watch in the course of our film the migration within people through a whole range of relationships as if the, it, it's almost schizophrenic, as if the battle is with ourselves as well as between ourselves. When we talk about all the divisions that the war, and Lynn and I feel that the Vietnam War is the most important event in American history in the second half of the 20th century, and is responsible, as your article today suggests, for a good deal of the divisions, we also have to understand that these just aren't abstract divisions between factions or regions or political ideologies, but psychological divisions within us. And that's I think one of the things we were so fortunate to get at in, in the exploration of the testimonies of the people we had the privilege to interview. Did anybody sentimentalize this war in your experience? You said you sentimentalized, yeah, compared to the World War I experience as you described it. Um, not in our experience, <laughs> the people that we met, no. I mean, I, I was about to say I think some of the people that we met in Vietnam on the winning side on the sort of political dimensions of that, perhaps. I wouldn't say sentimentalize, but maybe romanticize the war to some degree, in that it was a great heroic struggle and sort of everybody willingly sacrificed for the great cause and maybe not wanting to acknowledge the enormous actual toll it took. But that was rare, to be honest, that was rare. I think another important aspect of the Vietnam War is the silence. I mean, when I came back from the war, we were not treated well. And so we just grew our hair long and disappeared. And uh, it, it went on for decades just not talking about it. And that's, a, that's not, not healthy. What, in, the, in the film, you compare um, having Vietnam kind of hanging over the national conversation to living with an alcoholic in the house, like something that nobody could really talk about. When did that begin to change? Well, I think it started to change in the first Gulf War. I can remember, uh, <laughs> I lived in Portland at the time, and the, the merchants opened up their stores or the restaurants to give free, free meals to all the returning veterans, and the Vietnam veterans were sort of like, huh? <laughs> but, you know, what? You know, but but uh, that was when, when it started to, to shift, and uh, then people started to talk a little bit more about it. Uh, and then obviously, Recently, we've been at war about for what, 16 years, and uh, so there's there's been a, a major shift in. Uh, I think the country sort of had a bit of a guilt feeling about the way we treated the Vietnam veterans, and so now they're, in a way, almost overdoing it. I mean, anybody that comes in the airport in a uniform is, is a hero, and I, these guys, are, you know, they don't they don't pretend to be heroes. I mean, 95 percent of the military, you know, doesn't get into combat, and and uh, 
So good old America, we can't ever settle in the middle, you know. We, 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 I mean, we just can't. You know? You know, so that's. Um, this is an idea I'd love to come back to later, but I can't resist just asking now on this subject. When you talk about this American idea of ourselves, it, it, you, you speak about it in the present tense in the documentary. So despite the experience of Vietnam, we haven't been able to shed this illusion about our specialness, right? Is yeah, that what you no, think? I, and I, why, why is, how have we managed to cling to that despite the fairly devastating indictment of the national character that, and our well, leadership? You, you know, I, I, I wish I, I, I had thought about an answer to that because you just asked me the question. The first thing that comes into my mind is we, we don't read history. I mean, this country is a very present-oriented country, and so you, you, history is what, where you can learn some lessons. But we've repeated, the, you know, what I consider to be Vietnam, you know, quite often here lately, and uh, have have really learned nothing uh, from from the experiences. We just don't seem to. Again, if you're not talking about it, you're not analyzing it. You're not taking it apart, seeing what's right, seeing what's wrong. You're just quiet about it, and then it's the present moment. We're just going to do it again, and I think that that's a, an American characteristic. We're in the present, and history is just not anything we really are interested in. All right, why don't we, why don't we move to the, to the next clip, which gives us a, some sense of how the war looked from the Vietnamese perspective. I was brought up to believe that the communists were people who would uh, destroy the family, destroy religion, and people who had no allegiance to our country, but to international communism. My mother would describe them as no chau mat ngựa, which means that these are people with the head of a water buffalo and the face of a horse, meaning that they, they were subhumans and uh, they were brutal. But on the other hand, I, I thought they also include people like my sister Tang and a lot of my cousins. I, I couldn't quite reconcile the two images. But of the two, I think the other image was much stronger because I was so scared of them. I thought these people must be really, really horrible people. That was the frame of mind I had when I started doing research into the communist movement. Zhuang Von Mai was the daughter of an official in the South Vietnamese government and was now married to an American, David Elliott. Back in 1964, she had gone to work for the Rand Corporation in Saigon. The think tank had been commissioned by Robert McNamara to do a study of enemy prisoners to find out who are the Viet Cong and what makes them tick. I remember my first interview I was by myself, I was very young, and I was going to this pretty grim prison to interview this high-ranking cadre who had been captured. I went in thinking, I'm going to meet this beast, you know, this guy with the head of a water buffalo and the face of a horse. He walked in and he was very surprised to see me and <laughs> just as surprised as I was to see him. He was a man who had devoted all his life to fight for what he called a just cause, to free his country of foreign domination, to reunify the country under just uh, government. So he really totally believed in it, to the point that he sacrificed his whole life to this cause. So I left, I was very, I was very impressed with him. When the Rand report was presented to McNamara's top deputies at the Pentagon, Describing the Viet Cong as a dedicated enemy that could only be defeated at enormous cost, one senior official said, if what you say is true, we're fighting on the wrong side, the side that's going to lose this war. Maya, I wanted to ask you actually a couple of dimensions of that, but the first is the personal one, I guess. You, you mentioned that your sister was in the North, yet your mother gave this really, you know, ugly portrait of, of, of 
the, the typical North Vietnamese soldier. How did she reconcile herself with the idea that her family was itself divided? Um, you know, we were talking about uh, divisions within America, American society, while well, Vietnamese so, were extremely divided over the war. And the beauty about the film is that uh, it went way back to explain the origin of the war. And um, so that, you know, most people think the war started when Americans arrived, but actually the, the germs were planted a long time ago. And my family, and most people, the, the American involvement was so overwhelming that people tend to forget that for the Vietnamese, it was a, a, a civil war and that um, Vietnamese were divided um, and there were Vietnamese on this side and Vietnamese on the other side fighting each other. And the division happened even down to the family level. So in my family, my parents were very scared of the communists and, uh, because my father had worked um, for the French colonial administration. So he was very afraid that if the communists won, he and the entire family would be you know, eliminated, killed. And, but on the other hand, my sister, my older sister, um, was not afraid. And um, during the war to free Vietnam from French uh, colonialism, my sister uh, left Hanoi and went into the mountain, into the um, jungle to join the forces of Ho Chi Minh. So um, from that division, that division I, think yeah, I think we better switch up. That division persisted uh, during the Vietnam War so that we were on both sides of the fight, if you will. And my family was not the only one that was divided like that. There were just thousands, hundreds of thousands, even among some South Vietnamese leaders. They had brothers on the other side, uncles on the other side, and nobody knew about this division until after the end of the war, when people said, oh, you know, that general, his brother was a general among in the Viet Cong ranks. So th that was a, um, a, a deep divide within the Vietnamese family. And for my family, it persisted because uh, we kept fleeing every time the communists won and took over, like when they took over the north, we fled to Saigon. And when they came to Saigon, my family had fled to the United States. And so I myself, I was separated from the sister um, for about like 43 years. I didn't see her until she left the family in 1946 and I didn't see her again until 1993. What was that reconciliation like? I'm Were sorry? you? What was it? What, what was the reconciliation like? How did? Well, Vietnamese family bonds are very strong. So, in spite of everything, my parents were never uh, mad at her. They never held it against her. And uh, actually, uh, in 1975 when the communists were about to win, my mother wanted to stay in, in Saigon and meet my sister. But in the end, fear <laughs> dominated and my father persuaded her to flee. So my parents never saw her again. So, um, so that was one of the things that uh, my mother felt very sad about, that they never saw her again. Now I'd like to ask you about the second theme in that clip. Um, the message that you were kind of delivering in your work at RAND, that the North Vietnamese soldier was actually a pretty formidable um, um, foe with a very you know, powerful cause to fight for. Did you feel like the Americans were getting that message? Did, did they, at the time, in those early years, did, they, did it seem to you that they, they knew what they were doing? Well, um, the reason this, um, the, the Defense Department or McNamara commissioned this study by the Rand Corporation was because the Americans didn't understand who they were fighting. At the time, the most prevalent description of the Viet Cong as, as, as is faceless enemies. You know, who are these guys? And the Americans were pounding them, and yet they didn't 
you know, give up. They kept fighting. And actually, in 1964, when this project started, they were winning. So McNamara wanted to know, who are these guys, you know? What, what motivated them to join the insurgency? What motivated them to fight so hard uh, despite the American power? And if they gave up, why did they give up? So our job was to find the answers to these questions. And as, um, um, as a middle class Vietnamese, I had no idea who these people were. I was scared of them, and that was about it. And I thought, like most middle class Vietnamese at the time thought, that the peasants who joined the insurgency were dupes of the Viet Cong. You know, they were uneducated, not sophisticated, and they fell for the promises of the Viet Cong. And, but when I started talking to these people, the peasants who joined the Viet Cong, I realized that they had real grievances and they knew what they were doing. You know, they were suffering and they thought that the communists had the answer, the communists would put an end to their suffering. They thought the communists would unify the country and kicked out the Americans because Vietnamese history is all about fighting people who come in and try to take us over, first the Chinese and then the French, and then now the Americans. So they were really motivated by um, nationalism. They wanted to get rid of the Americans, and they were also motivated by the dream of uh, a different society where they would have economic and social justice. So they had real uh, grievances. And they were very determined because they believed in their cause, like I described in the, the, the clip. To them, it is a just cause, something worth fighting and dying for. So they were extremely committed. And as if you watch the film later on when it's released, you will hear one of the North Vietnamese saying that in a war, the side that has the most, uh, the fewest doubts is the side that is going to win. And that was the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong side. They really believe in that just cause, you know, to the point that a lot of them sacrifice years and years and decades of their lives to fight for. Can the, the as, as Mai said, by 1964, McNamara is worried that it's evident that the U.S. is losing or barely winning some battles. There's an early clip in the film of, I think it's Major um, Beckwith, Charles Beckwith, just having hung on to win a really awful struggle, saying, these soldiers are the best I've ever seen. I mean, it's a very experienced combat veteran. I think talking to the press, actually. So it's not like there weren't a lot of signs early on, but they don't seem to have been processed. This is the whole, I mean, one of the great tragedies among the many, many aspects and or dimensions of this tragedy is exactly that. The failure for this essential elemental truth to sort of trickle their way up and then not be ignored, to be digested and acted upon, and they just didn't happen. And we will tell you that this goes back to the Truman administration and the Eisenhower administration and the Kennedy administration and all of these administrations, not just Johnson and Nixon, they're all kicking the, the, it, you know, the can down the road to avoid making tough choices based on essentially domestic political considerations, meaning they, don't, they want to be reelected and they'll be willing to ignore this fundamental facts of this war. Beckwith is unbelievable. It's an amazing assault. His soldiers are unbelievable. And uh, they repel attack after attack after attack. But at the end, you expect him to give this knee-jerk American yeah. speech about how we've got the finest fighting men ever. And he's basically talking about the Viet Cong as the finest fighting men ever. He'd love to have a couple of hundred of them on his side. He said it. You know, I mean, and and, and it, this happens over and over again. We have a pilot who is bombing the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and he never, ever really interrupts the flow of traffic. And he, he has great admiration, and he says, you know, what you need to do in a war is get on the right side. And the Saigon government was corrupt, and their people knew it, and we knew it. And he said, I would have been proud to serve with those truck drivers going up and down. So everywhere we turned was the sort of 
right in front of your face, but the, the policymakers continued to ignore the information. The Pentagon Papers, which the New York Times heroically published along with the Boston Globe and the Washington Post, were all about McNamara trying to collate all the, 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 these doubts. And so they're an, an incredible indictment. And you read about or you hear in the tapes in our film where, you know, on, in the morning they are expressing this anguish about being able to win and then going out in the afternoon and giving a press conference saying, we're winning. And it is, it is a disconnect from the truth from, from the beginning to the end. It, yeah, I, I, I just, you know, um, Carl has a comment in the film. I'm going to tee you up to share it with the people here because there's a sense of the frustration our leaders feel. They understand some of the dynamics, maybe not everything, but they definitely are frustrated that they can't make it all work. And that's a recurrent theme. And, you know, um, McNamara writes a very famous, now famous memo because of the Pentagon Papers. In 65, they have a meeting and they're discussing, should we escalate? Should we send in more troops? Or should we find a way to withdraw and negotiate? And they basically weigh the you know, pros and cons. What's the chance of victory? And they basically, he's advised by everyone around him that Johnson is, is, is told that the chance of victory is one in three. And yet they vote to escalate. And I, Carl in the film says something very important about like, looking back at that, it's 1965. You know? and how that, now knowing that, and you were there a few years later. You know, the, <clears throat> the other thing, we talk a lot about American idealism, and uh, one of the things that uh, happened then, and I still think to some extent now, is that we forget that when we're at war, we are involved in the killing of people. This is not some kind of abstract uh, corporate decision about whether we're going to get more uh, market share or you know numbers like that. And if you can't explain to a 19-year-old that he's going to risk his life or his limbs in order for his sister and his mother not to have that happen to them, if you can't explain that simply, then you really better examine why we're why we're actually out there killing people because it's a it's a moral issue. It's not an abstract issue. And I, I'm no pacifist. I mean, I'm a Marine, you know. But I just, uh, I think that we, f we forget that the seriousness of it. And you can get to some level, I guess, in Washington, D.C., where you start, it's just numbers. But, uh, and then you try to explain, why are you over there doing this, killing people and risking being killed? Because they're going to hurt my family. Okay, I get it. But... We lost that. I mean, we, we, we sort of got, from World War II on, we sort of lost that. It is, one of the, one of the things, experiences I had as a viewer watching this film is just, it's, it's so thrust in your face from how early on the leadership recognized that they weren't, I mean, you've got John Kennedy as a senator, I think, in Saigon, right? Um, what? Congressman. Con Congressman. In 1951, Congressman. Yeah. Right. L looking at the French experience, actually a meeting with the Timesman, I think, Seymour Topping, who's telling him the French are going to lose, and c coming to the conclusion that this is unwinnable for them. And yet, then he comes into office and, and repeats the same mistakes, believing it's not going to work, really, yeah. right? Is that a fair... Well, I, I, I'm not sure is that, that too Kennedy strong? believed it wasn't going to work. I think he got boxed into a kind of political... A corner, and again, it's where other events. This is a proxy war, right? We have to understand this is a limited war, and so we're in short of having nuclear Armageddon, World War III. We're going to fight our adversaries, not against them, but we're going to fight it in South Vietnam, where their proxies, the North Vietnamese, are are happening. And and this is where we get into the problem. Kennedy's dilemma is is very very interesting. He inherits seven or eight hundred advisors that are now in Vietnam. By the time he's assassinated, it's 17,000, something like that. But he, early in his administration in, 60, in 61, he has been humiliated at the Bay of Pigs. He's been humiliated by Khrushchev at Vienna. He can't stop the Soviets from building the Berlin Wall. And Eisenhower has begged him to intervene in a communist insurgency in Laos, and he goes, no, and realizes that if he's ever going to have a chance of being reelected, he better draw the line in South Vietnam. And so all of a sudden, things sort of plow through political exigencies and not through practical ones. So let me, let me frame the question more precisely then. 
and maybe history doesn't work this way, maybe there is no precise answer, but so was it for him a political problem or did he really believe the domino theory and really believe that the U.S. needed to be there? He, was he worried about his domestic politics or was he worried about containing communism? Well, domestic politics is one thing. The domestic agenda, I should say, is one thing. Being reelected was certainly a key right. thing. But I think he, I'm not sure to the extent that he fully engaged the domino theory, but just about everybody subscribed to it. But he really understood that he, the Americans, were required to exert this kind of effort to contain communism and the way to do it was to, to get involved in Vietnam and make sure that this wasn't going to happen. And it's... You know, we always, you know, we have the dream of Camelot that, you know, if Kennedy had only lived, he would have not gotten us into it. But Lyndon Johnson, who had only domestic, he was just wanted to be the second coming of FDR and transform the United States with a kind of second New Deal, which we call the Great Society, and he did unbelievable things domestically. He turned to the entire foreign policy apparatus that Kennedy had brought in and said, I need you guys more than he did. And those guys led him, the Kennedy guys, led them into Vietnam. So we, we obviously we don't know what would have happened if Kennedy had lived, and he has a very rueful um, sort of regrets about the, the, uh, the, the tacit approval we gave for the coup that overthrew the corrupt ZM and his brother knew, and the tragic consequences that flowed from that. So maybe he could have had a transformation, as he did on civil rights, but... It didn't happen, and his people led Lyndon Johnson, and Lyndon Johnson led himself, you know, into full-scale escalation and, and real boots on the ground by early 65. I want right, to add something you asked about, you know, there's a second um, a coda to the RAND Corporation research. Um, so when this was the uh, project, the conclusions were presented that the Viet Cong were extremely motivated and that it would be tough to defeat them. So then by that time, the Gulf of Tonkin had happened. The bombing of the North had begun. The, Ameri um, the United States were even more deeply involved in Vietnam. So then the question became from the de Defense Department to Rand, the question was, OK, we know they're very strong, so tell us where they're weak, what their vulnerabilities are, how do we defeat them? How can we find the chinks in the armor? So a second team of RAND research did the second phase, which was where are the weaknesses of the Viet Cong? And they found that, or at least the analysts who conducted the study found that bombing was the answer. The more bombing, the better. And bombing not only um, scare them, um, turn them from hunters into hunted, but it also drove the peasants from their villages into the areas under control of the government. So draining the water in which the fish was swimming. As Mao Zedong described guerrilla warfare as guerrillas, are the fish swimming in the water among the people. So the objective was to bomb them, getting out, getting them out of Viet Cong control areas into government control areas where we could control them. Carl, did you want to weigh in yeah, before I was you just see the next say, Sort of picking up on what Ken was saying is that I think it's also important to understand that these people were World War II veterans and that very much shaped their mm -hmm. view of the world. Right. They fought serious dictators who were seriously trying to take over the world, okay? And so they just saw it coming again. Yeah. And I think that was a sort of a, an unspoken sort of mindset. I mean, it, wasn't, it, 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 it astounds me, but we, our foreign policies are never analyzed out in the open. I mean, our current foreign policy, I don't know, let's call it being the policeman of the world. I've never heard people debate it. I mean, I, I never heard it. You know, and so, so that's the, unconsciously, they, would, they saw it coming again. And I think you have to give them credit that, that that's the way they saw it. That where I don't give them credit is that they should have realized after a very short period of time that it wasn't a monolithic communist attempt to take over the world. This was a small country trying to free itself from French control. And then, you know, yes, they wanted to have a communist government, but it was, it was all there. It wasn't, they weren't coming to Santa Monica, you know. Yeah, but I, you know, I, I mean, having worked on the film and sort of tried, we tried to, you know, go back to the beginning and 
pick up the pieces and try to understand how this all fits together in chronological order. And one of the devastating scenes that I remember, I had not known about before was uh, Senator Fulbright of the Foreign Relations Committee had hearings in 1966 about whether we should be in Vietnam. And President Johnson did not want the country to watch it, so he tried to get, he was hoping that the networks wouldn't cover it, but some of them did. And you know, you see some pretty devastating testimony from George Kennan, the author of Containment, and he's asked, is containment relevant in Vietnam? This is 1966. And he says, no, it is not relevant. And then he says, you know, if we were not already involved in Vietnam, I see no reason for us to get involved. And that's, again, 1966. So even if there was, you know, um, there were dissenting views very early on that had credibility. So it's not as though no one was saying this is not going to work. And there's also a famous memo by one of the undersecretaries of state, George Ball, um, within the Johnson administration about whether we should send in ground troops. And he made a very compelling argument for all the reasons why it wouldn't work. And he was absolutely right. And his argument was heard. And then they just moved on. So, you know, they had the conversation. But as Ken was saying, I think for domestic political considerations, for worries about World War II, and also I think their own ego has not a small part. I mean, these are not shrinking violets. So they have a lot of personal credibility at stake, the way they see it. And being the first president to lose a war, I think was utterly unthinkable, utterly unthinkable. So they would do anything to avoid it. And, and that Kennan testimony is amazing. And he also, you have him saying, um, that the U.S. needs to shed its illusions of invincibility, right? Which is what, yeah. And not, um. have, the elephant be, <laughs> and not have the elephant be afraid of the mouse. Right. You know, and he was just saying, why are we even putting ourselves into this dynamic? I'm asking too many questions and slowing us down. Is there a way we can skip to the fourth clip? I hate to miss any one of these, but we'd, I'd like to get to audience questions. And you guys should hear LBJ. Um, in the fourth club, if that's possible. And, and, the, and the setup to this is that in our sixth episode, the Tet Offensive is raging. And the Tet Offensive is an unmitigated disaster for the North. Uh, but but they, and they, they lose in every single place that they attack, uh, including Saigon, including Hue, and, and in, you know, dozens and dozens of places throughout the South Vietnam. Um, but uh, to a United States government, which is saying that there's light at the end of the tunnel, that it's all working out, that everything's going fine, the Tet Offensive is an utter disaster. And night after night, for weeks, we're seeing the effects of it, and it's beginning to change uh, the minds of the people. So this is uh, within a week of the beginning of the Tet Offensive, the short, very short scene we're going to right now, if possible. watching the networks, reading the morning papers, was how can we win, possibly win, and survive as a nation and have to fight the press is lies. Yes, sir. I'm trying to protect my country, and they all whipping me. Not a son of a bitch said a word about Ho Chi Minh. They talk about us bombing. Yet these sons of bitches come in and bomb our embassy, and 19 of them try to raid on. All 19 get killed. And yet they blame the embassy. <laughs> I don't understand it. We think we've killed 20,000. We think we've lost 400. We think that, of course, it's bad to lose anybody, any one of the 400. But we think that the good Lord has been so good to us that it is a major, dramatic victory. And I think, what would have happened if I'd lost 20,000 and they'd lost 400? I ask you that. So LBJ is right, by the way. It's a unbelievable victory in a military sense for the United States and, and our Arvin allies, but in every other respect, it's a disaster. But it's fake news that he's complaining yeah. about. Yeah, <laughs> yep. And well, you know, uh, one of the really interesting themes that we discovered through the course of this was the president's desperate determination to control the narrative in a democracy with a free press. 
the North Vietnamese are very able to control the narrative. They don't have a democracy and they don't have a free press. But our country, they're constantly trying to you know, find a way to get the story they want into the papers and onto TV and it, it eludes them, ultimately. Did he really believe what he was saying? Did he believe that the press was losing the war for him? He, he was very frustrated continually, I mean, from the beginning. So I, I think he certainly felt like at one point he was asked, why don't you, t you know, censor the press? And he said, because we're idiots. So I think he, he really <laughs> felt that we should be not letting them just say what they want. And, you know, that um, people were trying to advance their own careers and weren't interested in being on the team. That was a theme, that, a phrase that was often used. So, but then, you know. I, I think that frustration is genuine and it's manifest yeah. in, in, in other places. And I think, you know, we talk about the lessons that have been learned about Vietnam. And one of them is we're not going to blame the warriors anymore. And the other is that um, the military is very good at pretending like there's a free press. And if we embed you, you'll think you're embedded in the war, but actually, we're surrounding you, and you're not going to be like morally safer catching Marines burning down a, a village, and you're not going to be present when the head of the Ch national police assassinates a North Vietnamese spy on the streets of Saigon, and you're not going to be there to witness a little girl being burned by napalm, and all of these things will be a little bit more controllable, as it had been in World War II much more controlled. So Vietnam represented for the military this disaster because they understood afterwards what video meant, what it was to see a piece of film. And, you know, they were less concerned with the print press, though, uh, you know, much more than, than we are today. And uh, it was pretty devastating. Uh, what, you know, they learned the lesson, and we, we were last night in Washington with a lot of military people, and that was the lesson they absolutely learned. For the Gulf War, but yeah, but there is a sort of a myth of the war that the, the that the press coverage did turn public opinion against the war, and in fact, it was the data and the polling and all of that shows that it was the continual casualties and no real progress and no ability to see well, are we winning? What does winning look like? When is this going to be over? And it's just around the corner, and yet more people keep dying, and the the purposeless per, the inability for the country to articulate what the actual purpose was, as Carl was saying. And so by the time this happened, the, the public opinion had already shifted dramatically um, against the war. Well, I'd like to open it up um, to the audience. I think we've got a couple microphones that will circulate. And I'd, I'd, I'd love to ask you to please ask your question in the form of a question. <laughs> and um, <laughs> give, give, give. It's so un-American. <laughs> Um, so that we can get as many in as possible. Please, you make the call. Uh, hi, I'm Richard Green. I had a question about the uh, economic dimension of the war and the fact that uh, a lot of money is made by people during a war. Uh, my specific question is, I was going to ask you to address the complicity that existed between elected officials from whose constituents were benefiting and profiting from the war in this country, and the impact that you thought that might have, or you thought that that had on the progress of the war. Uh, a specific example, uh, my recollection is that during the Vietnam War, this country became the number one exporter of rice, and that's because other exporters were engaged in the uh, conflict itself. So I was gonna ask if you would just address that. You know, it's, it's very, very interesting. We were just having a conversation about this yesterday, and I think one of the things, not that the film neglects, but that the film can't be an encyclopedia, it can't be a dictionary, it can't tell every single story, but a huge dimension to the story that goes beyond our film is exactly an economic one, an economic determinist one. And one could argue that the great warning of Eisenhower as he leaves office about the military-industrial complex is not something that he's going to talk about on Monday because it just started up last Thursday. It started in 1945 when all of those folks who had made such extraordinary profits just didn't want to see those profits go away. And so there becomes baked into an American political process a motivation and a momentum for that kind of spending. And, and I think that we 
I don't think we consciously neglected it, but I, but I think it's implied in the intervals between the scenes of, of, of what that means. But uh, I would apologize to you in advance, sir, for that excellent and very germane question that, that we didn't address it full on the way I think you're asking us to. Can we? Hello. Hello, everybody. Hello. Carl, this is for you. You touched on um, the killing. Whenever I talk to people, and I had an anti-war stance for a long time, I'm getting nervous now that I might becoming, be becoming a pacifist. You said you couldn't be a pacifist because you were a Marine. Can you talk to what does that mean? I was, I was in the Saigon uh, Times Bureau when Henry Cam came in and exposed Mi Lai. So how do you understand the brutality and the parents who lose their children and to take it now to the kids that come back limbless or mindless? First of all, um, you're absolutely right about the costs. They're horrendous. But I am not a pacifist because I do believe, given my view of human nature, that if everybody were a pacifist except one person, that person would dictate exactly what, what should be done and how we should behave. And I believe very firmly in government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And if somebody wants to try and coerce me to not behave like that, then I will fight. And I think that that goes back to the, the, your point, the costs of defending that way of being in the world can sometimes be horrendous. And we wish we didn't have to end up like that. And generally speaking, I think it's failures. I think our kids go in and, and clean up failures in, in diplomacy. I think that a lot of these wars we've gotten into could have been worked out ahead of time. Uh, but when, when they can't be worked out, I don't think you can reason with, you know, Hitler or Stalin. I mean, these people are not reasonable people. So at some point, force is the answer. Uh, I wish it weren't true, but I don't agree. I just am not a pacifist. I, I'm curious about, <clears throat> in this process of making this film, I'm curious about what was personally surprising to you. I, you know, just in the course of your talk, I have been surprised. My father is a Vietnam veteran and returned from Vietnam 50 years ago, pretty much now. Um, and I've done a fair amount of looking at the war. But I'm just wondering what was, what was personally surprising to you? <laughs> Everything. I grew up in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I had, you know, I was eligible, eligible for the draft later on. To, my father was in the anthropology department where one of the first teach-ins was organized there. I mean, I was fully invested in Vietnam from the very beginning and thought I knew something about it. And for all of us, it was a daily humiliation that almost everything that you believe is upside down. Ho Chi Minh is the supreme leader. Not quite right. There's another guy who's really, at, you know, a dominant figure on the Politburo. Don't you want to know about that? So if the basic assumptions at that level are wrong, then it, the, it, it's the domino theory. Everything else begins to, to topple. And so we had to deliberately unpack not just what happened, but what we believed and sort of shed a kind of superficial, conventional wisdom that, that we all develop, and, and then begun to repack what the 42 years of scholarship has delivered to us, what the extraordinary testimony of our witnesses have done, and there, you know, more, we filmed more than 100, but there's 80 in the film, uh, have been able to give us, and then sort of intertwine and interbraid these stories like a kind of epic novel with primary and secondary and tertiary characters into some narrative. And at every intersection, 
there was the explosion of myth. There was the humiliation of being just dead wrong about what we thought had happened. And that's, at, at some point, if it isn't about your own self-aggrandizement, it's exhilarating and liberating. And we hope that in some way we've been able to, not bottle, but we've been able to sort of aggregate, to use our, our, our modern words, we've been able to aggregate some of that humiliation and some of that new surprising things to be able to share not what we wanted to tell you about Vietnam, but our process of discovery. And that is liberating for us in some way. Um, I would just be curious because both Mai and Carl have been advisors and seen the film multiple times, and you lived through it and are witnesses, but I'm wondering from your perspective of seeing the whole film, what surprised you? Well, I, I, would be... admit that I thought we were fighting Ho Chi Minh. I can't tell you, it was like, who? <laughs> Yeah. By 1959, there's a guy named Les Zwan who begins to rise to some prominence in the Politburo, and it's him that who is the designer of the Tet Offensive. It's him who is sort of doing it, and our government, we didn't even hear his name until 1966. And so, you know, and he's, he's it. I mean, Ho Chi Minh had some remain powerful on the Politburo. He was the figurehead to his country, the beloved father of independence, and, and, and the face of the war to the rest of the world. But this is not what happened. So <laughs> all of a sudden, the terra firma of just the basic who, what, when, where, and why are gone. And well, that's the, the, the other one, Ken, that, that just surprised me is that, you know, the Marines were at Quezon, surrounded, you know, and, and it was going to be another Dien Bien Phu because General Jap, the genius of Dien Bien Phu, was, was organizing all these forces and the Marines were going to get overwhelmed and it was going to be horrible. He was in Hungary? Yeah. <laughs> so, so General, yeah. General Zop, who is given credit, we, we say Giap, but the actual correct pronunciation is this, yeah. right? Uh, my is, is Zop. General Zop had so protested the uh, Tet Offensive as a proposed plan on the Politburo uh, that Les Wan had wanted that his entire staff was arrested and he was sent to Hungary. So the person who is most credited with designing and planning the Tet Offensive is actually not responsible for it, sir. And so, you know, it gets shakier and shakier and you just got to give up at some point, as we did. Well, I mean, it's, it's interesting. We ended up with, you know, a line in the script pretty late on that there was upheaval and dissent in Hanoi and Saigon and Washington and that, you know, we didn't have consensus here about what to do about the war as we were just talking about with George Ball and Johnson. And in Hanoi, there were different factions that had different ideas about how to win the war, how long it would take, what to do. And there was a constant debate. And we don't know all about this because those records have not been fully declassified. So... There's some of it is just inference from scholars, but um, you know there was a sense of how urgently do we need to liberate the country? How quickly do we need to do it? When will the Americans go away? You know what's the perfect sauce here? And there was constant trying different choice, different ways to do that, and that was really interesting to discover as we worked through the whole story. Well, for me, I've done a lot of research about the war for my books and. Uh, I've watched a lot of documentaries and so on. But what surprised me is watching this documentary in the aggregate, as you put it. What surprises me is the journey that the United States, Vietnam, American society, Vietnamese society took. So from the beginning to the end, you saw this journey unfolding, but also for the uh, people, the Americans and the Vietnamese who were involved in this war, who fought in this war, who were witnesses to the war, who lived through it. It was also a personal journey for all of them. And you saw them at the beginning and then at the end, you saw how they were transformed by the war, by this terrible journey they went through. And to me, after I watched it, I was just so overwhelmed by it. I thought, wow, what a way of telling a very complicated story. I'd like to ask one of the Facebook Live questions, but actually just to one brief 
note, Ken, you've referred a couple of times to interviewing 100 people. That's just on camera. You guys interviewed well over 1,000, right, Lynn? I mean, yes, Many more I think, to, you know, to um, and I should really, I must give credit where credit is due. Sarah Botstein, who's in the audience, who's our producer, did an enormous amount of this work. We, you know, and some of our other staff in our production office um, talked to people on the phone, emailing, corresponding, following leads. You know, we might be looking for, there was a, a one particular uh, story that we had of um, a GI who was killed and we had his tapes that he sent home. We tried to find people who served with him. So we're talking to many, many people to try to find a few that might be in the film. In fact, we didn't end up using that material. So there's a lot of dead ends that we followed. I think that um, some of our team talked to many of Carl's platoon mates to see if any of them would be, might want to talk to. And yes, <laughs> they gave us pictures of Carl that Carl hadn't seen in a long time, so there's, which is very exciting. Yeah, so we, you know, we followed up in many, many leads, and it's sort of a, a process of distillation and elimination and trial and error, and um, you know, trying to find the people who just are going to be able to do what we want them to do and what they find out what they have to say. So it takes a lot to get to that 80 people that are in the film. Okay, this is from James Marshall. How can we apply the lessons learned from the Vietnam War to what's going on today? So, so history is the set of questions we in the present ask of the past, and it can't help but be informed, however, subconsciously by our own fears and anxieties, as well as hopes and dreams about it. When we are working on a project like this, it's not so much history as story. And our obligation is to actually focus on the best possible story we can tell, the most complex, the most nuanced, something that progresses in which the conflicts, as we've suggested, are not just between peoples, but often within peoples and journeys that they take, as Mai said so poetically. Um, but we also are aware that the one thing we shouldn't do is kind of point those neon signs saying, isn't this so like today? I mean, we could have started off and said, hey, you know what? We've been working for 10 years of, 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 on a film about mass demonstrations across America in all these cities, about a White House consumed and obsessed with leaks, about big document drops into the public uh, of, of purloined classified material, about asymmetrical warfare, about a political campaign reaching out and having contact with a foreign power in the middle of election cycle. And you guys would go, oh, wow, you've abandoned history and you're talking about today. But all we knew was that if we told the story, the story would, as Mark Twain is supposed to have suggested, not repeat itself in the present, but rhyme. And our job is to listen to the rhymes or at least focus on telling the stories so that we know in some ways those rhymes land. And so without the, the neon signs, without the arrows, we're aware of that. Therefore, it's incumbent upon us not to preach didactically what ought to be the lesson from this or to list in that way, but to understand that if you tell a story well, the free electrons of the collisions of characters, of moments, of place, of language, of art, of psychology, all of these things will give off enough that will arm us if we're willing. And it'll be different for you than it was for me or Lynn during it, or how my saw it compared to Carl, or what you feel, and that's fine. And so I would hate to draw up a big list on the blackboard and say there'll be a test on Tuesday about what the lessons of Vietnam are. Let's turn back to the audience for another oh. question, please. What? Thanks. Um, Carl, I, I just wanted to say uh, thanks for your service. Your uh, voice on these issues is greatly appreciated. Um, last year, I gave a TED Talk on the struggles of Iraq and Afghanistan veterans. And I just wanted to know, can I get that link to you? I would love you to take a look at it. I'd be delighted. Yeah, yeah how, how do I do that? <laughs> you want to tell everybody my email address here? <laughs> We'll get you afterward. Let's yeah. use our last three minutes for another, so uh, for another question, if we could. Hello. <clears throat> Hi. Well, thanks, for everybody, for being here tonight. And uh, uh, I know I was startled when I, when I read in Christian Appy's really excellent 
oral history of Vietnam called Patriots, that for a lot of people in Vietnam, it wasn't, they didn't call it the Vietnam War, they called it the American War. And um, that was kind of a revelation. <laughs> but uh, uh, I was just wondering, now since that book, since oral history, you know, talking to people on all sides, high, high positions, low positions, whatnot, it's, you know, it sounds, you know, it sounds like a sort of echoing, you know, the, your, your approach to, you know, to your documentary. And I'm just wondering, uh, did you use that book as any kind of reference or what other books or films were influences? We digested as much, I didn't watch any films, but uh, Sarah and Lynn did, and we digested as much material as we could, scholarly and otherwise. And, but we agree with you. When Americans have treated Vietnam, we've tended to do it, you know, as, as somebody said, TR had written his book about uh, his, you know, uh, experiences in the Spanish-American War, which was alone in Cuba. You know, <laughs> that somehow, all the other participants did not exist. And that it had been, you know, that some friend of the president had even said, or the future president had even said that the, that the publisher had run out of the eye uh, in printing the book. And, and we've noticed that, you know, if you think about the deer hunter, there's not a Vietnamese character that's real. And that's our, our problem and what consciously in this was to say we wish to triangulate this story and understand that for many people it was an American war and not just the Vietnam War. Can we have time for one more? This is for Carl. Um, I know you had a bad day at the White Elephant, I believe, in Da Nang. I am not the Red Cross worker that was there that day, but I did spend a year there. And you talk about in your book um, what it's like to go to war and you talk about being conscious. I know that after my year there, that if I had been conscious at the end of the day, I couldn't have done my job the next day, because my job was to distract you from your job. Mm -hmm. So when I went to LZs and when I went to fire bases, et cetera, my job was to make you all forget about the war. So the question is, how can we heal faster? How can we help you more? Well, first of all, everybody was delighted to see you. And, um, <laughs> so that's not a, not a debatable issue. I think that, that one of the most important things to remember is we're dealing with kids. Co combat Marines and, and Army infantry are 19, 18, 20-year-olds, OK? And uh, they're not real conscious people. I mean. Uh, you know, I mean, I've got five of them, and, and you know, you, at that age, if it was raining outside, and you said, have you got your raincoat, they'd look at you like you were crazy and go out the door, you know. Um, and so, they're the ones that are the best fighters. That's, in a way, it's because they're unconscious about it. So, um, what we need to do is, I think that the approach of just going there and, and being nice to them and, and being a girl, I mean, it was just, wow, you know? I mean, that's just, that, I mean, that's an incredible thing in an 18, 19, 20, that's what they want. I don't think we should expect them to get conscious about it. We expect our political leaders, our adults, to be conscious about it. They are the ones that are responsible for the consciousness. The 18 to 20 year olds are the ones that are great at fighting. And it's in part because they are unconscious. They just go for it. I would never want to have a platoon of 35-year-olds. <laughs> wow. Uh, I think that we need to leave it there, yeah. and it's not a bad place to leave it. So thank you guys very much. <laughs> you guys are great. <laughs>